Once again, good morning. As always, wonderful to see y'all this morning. Wonderful to see some visitors. As Brian mentioned earlier, uh, if you're visiting with us and you don't have a Bible of your own, there's some on the back table. Please feel free to take one of those with our compliments. We want you to have come here hearing the Word of God, meeting God's wonderful people, and leaving with the Word of God. Is it not obvious? Kind of got this guy with a snooty, snooty face. Um, starting a, a new series over the next couple of weeks, looking at the, uh, what's called apologetics. Okay, uh, apologia. If I can get the uh, if I can get the little Bluetooth thing going here, maybe maybe not. I don't know. I'm hoping it's going to be a long sermon if I can't get this remote working. Let me tell you, uh, apologia as a noun. It's a formal written defense of one's opinion or conduct. In English, as things change over the years, in English, it's become to make an apology. To make an apology. Now, as we use it in English to apologize, there is nowhere in Scripture that God apologizes for anything. Nor is there any occasion where Jesus apologizes. I'm sorry I healed you. You know, what's he going to say, right? There's also no command for Christians to apologize. Now, yes, uh, the Bible tells us to, recon to initiate reconciliation if we know that a brother or sister has something against us. Uh, yes, we are to do all that we can to pursue peace. But there is a difference between an apology and an authentic offering of repentance. There's a difference. I mean, we even know it with kids. There's a difference between, you know, someone just saying, I'm sorry, versus, you know, I apologize and telling why and why they're sorry and, and all of that. So there is, uh, there is a difference, but that's not why we're here this morning. What we're here to do is to begin mounting an, a defense, which is what Scripture tells us to do. Uh, we're going to be going kind of fast, so you might want to have to put on your seatbelts or something. we got a lot to cover. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 tells us, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, holy always being ready, ready to make a defense, apologia, to anyone who asks for you for a reason for the hope that is in you, but to do it with gentleness and respect. Now, in the previous verses there in 1 Peter 3, it's talking about persecution. It's talking about the way that the world is. When the world is just going to hell in a handbasket and you should be absolutely miserable, but you're not because we're to be a people of hope, need to be able to defend why you have that hope. Be able to tell people about it. And that, that's, that's why we're here. Because over the next couple of weeks, as I mentioned, we're going to look at some common arguments that people use uh, to distrust the Bible, to ignore God's commands, and flat out pursue a life that will send them straight into the furnace. Not my words. That's what we're going to do. This week we're primarily looking at how the Bible stacks up against historical documents. Next week we're going to look at some events surrounding the birth and ministry of Christ and how history records them. And then, uh, you know, the week after that, it'll be a surprise. Now, why are we doing this, though? Well, we're doing it for a few reasons. First, we're doing it for the Christians who need a reassurance of their faith. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. There, can, there will, if not, have be several moments that maybe you're just not sure. Something comes up. Maybe you're studying your Bible and there's just something that just sticks out at you like it never has before. And see, so you're just not sure. So we're doing it for that reason. We're also doing it for Christians who need to know how to address the concerns of others. Now, you don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to be able to address every concern that's just impossible. So we're just really kind of looking at some of the common ones. 
need to be able to answer people's questions, to offer an apologia, a defense for the hope that's in you. And we're doing it for the non-Christians, those who just need a little extra help in knowing that they can fully trust the Word of God, those people who are kind of, you know, I want to believe, I know I should believe, but there's just something kind of nagging at me that's really stopping me from making a full commitment. So we're doing it for, for them too. And like I said this week, we're looking to see as to how the Bible stacks up against some of the most famous documents in history. For example, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, he's a Roman general and statesman. He wrote what's called the, the Gallic Wars in 100 B.C. In it, Caesar describes the battles and the intrigues that took place in the nine years that he spent fighting the Celtic and Germanic peoples in Gaul that opposed Roman conquest. It is actually required reading at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. It was a favorite of World War II four-star General George Patton the general who was most feared by the Nazis. It is textbook on repelling invading forces. Written 100 BC. Of that we have 10 manuscripts, 10 original manuscripts or fragments. The oldest copy that we have is AD 900. AD 900. That's the oldest that we have. And if you notice, there's a little timeline there. You might be, not be able to see it so far at the back, but there's a little timeline. On the one end, we have when it was written, and then on the other end, we have the oldest document that we have. So between the two, for this particular work, there is a gap of 1,000 years. From 100 B.C. when it was written to A.D. 900, the oldest copy that we have. Make sense? Kind of, sort of? Hopefully. Okay. So then, then we have Plato and Plato's works written about 400 BC. Plato being a student of Socrates, he was a philosopher. His most famous work, The Republic, undertakes to show what justice is and why it's in the best interest for each individual to be just. It's standard reading in colleges and universities and courses from uh, philosophy to public speaking even and uh, political science. It's used in public speaking. Have you ever heard a public speaker say the same thing three times but they say it three different ways? Yeah, that's because of Plato. That's his fault. So it's kind of a core there in, in public speaking. Of his works, uh, we have, hello, there we go. Oh, I tell you, technology hates me. We have seven manuscripts, just seven. And the oldest one is A.D. 900. Can I get a click? I got like 40 something clicks to go so this might take a bit all right AD 900 so from the time of when it was written to the oldest copy that we have a gap of 1300 years after that we have Tacitus There we go. You know, we're, we're going to have a prayer for, for a miracle here real quick. That's what we're going to do. Uh, Tacitus. Uh, he is a Roman historian. His Annals of History. We use that in secular uh, reading as well in religious scholarship. Because what he does, the Roman senator, he gives a history of the Roman Empire from the reign of Tiberius to that of Nero. And in this Annals of History, he talks about Christians being persecuted and what have you. And he discusses the decline of political freedom in Rome. 
Uh, of this, we have 20 manuscripts. The original copy, or the oldest copy that we have, is A.D. 1100, with a gap of a thousand years. Next after that, we have Homer, Greek poet and author, writer of the Iliad. The Iliad, we have 643 manuscripts. 643 manuscripts. Now this was written 900 BC, one of the two great Greek poems, the other being the Odyssey. The Iliad follows Achilles and his hunger for honor. If you've ever heard of the Trojan horse and how it was used against the city of Troy, the Iliad is where it happens. All of the major Greek gods show up. Zeus, Poseidon, Hera, Athena, and others. It's actually one of the oldest works that is still published and widely read by audiences today. The oldest copy being 400 BC, a gap of 500 years. There's other notable documents in history that include Euripides' tragedies. We have 330 copies, Sophocles' plays, we have 226 copies. Josephus's works, we have 120 copies, copies. Josephus, you know, we look at his history of the Jews and religious scholarship. And so uh, we're, he was there when Jerusalem was captured in AD 70 and the temple was destroyed. So he's an important figure. We have Demosthenes' speeches. We have eight copies there, Aristotle who was an instructor of Alexander the Great. His works, we have 49 copies. 49 copies. 49 copies. Now, Shakespeare, we don't have any original manuscripts from. Would you be surprised to know that? William Shakespeare. Zero original manuscripts. In fact, there is no historical evidence that Shakespeare could write even a single sentence. The only thing that we have of his handwriting is six signatures, and all of them on legal documents. Even though we have no, no plays or anything, we just have six signatures of Shakespeare, scholars still insist that the 37 plays, 154 sonnets, and 375 poems all belong to him. Not a single sentence in his handwriting. Professors, they praise the virtue of Socrates, yet we don't have a single manuscript in his handwriting because he never wrote anything down. All that we have is what his students wrote and said what he said. No original manuscripts. And yet we accept these works without question. All of these that we have very, we've got a minimal number of manuscripts or no manuscripts at all of some of the most famous works in history and yet we take them all at face value. No one questions their authenticity. Not a single sentence of Shakespeare, only six signatures. Of course he wrote all of this stuff. Socrates, zero manuscripts, of course. Yes, he did that. We accept them at face value and no one questions him. So we have to ask ourselves, how does the Bible compare? How does the word of God compare? Now, before we answer that, I want to play devil's advocate for just a moment. I love doing that. We're going to play devil's advocate for just a moment. And we're going to go against the facts. We're going to go against history and say that all of, these, all of these works that we've just looked at each have 10,000 manuscripts. Even the one, we'll even give Socrates, who we don't have any, we're going to give him 10,000 manuscripts. We'll say they're all locked in a vault somewhere, the Disney vault probably. But they're all locked in the Disney vault and we just haven't discovered them yet. So we'll give Socrates, Shakespeare, uh, Sophocles, Demosthenes, all of them, 10,000 manuscripts. Okay? 
I mean, we're putting the odds in their favor, right? On top of that, we're going to look, we're going to take the most significant gap that we saw, which is 1,300 years. And we're going to reduce that down to 100 years. So we're going to give each of them 10,000 manuscripts, and we're going to reduce the gap down to 100 years. We're changing history. Do you feel it? Okay. So, now that we've done that, how does the Bible stack up? Of the Old Testament, we have more than 10,000 manuscripts or fragments. That's just of the Old Testament. More than 10,000. Of the New Testament, we have more than 5,000. Okay? Now, the earliest or the oldest New Testament document we have is 134 A.D. So if we go from the writing of the earliest New Testament book, and if you're wondering, it's not Matthew. In fact, the earliest New Testament letter written is the letter of James. The epistle of James was written in A.D. 50. So if we go from the earliest document that we have, A. James, A.D. 50, to the earliest New Testament document that we have, the writing to the founding, of 180, 134, that's a gap of 90, less than 90 years. And if we go from the last book that we have written, which is the letters of John, which were written between 90 and 95 AD, to the oldest New Testament document that we have, 180, 134, that's a gap of less than 40 years. So even if we change history and we take all of these works that are accepted without question, who don't even have original manuscripts, and we say, you know what, here's 10,000 manuscripts, take them. Even if we change history and we take that 1,300 year gap and we shrink it down to 100, It cannot compare to the Word of God. We accept them as authentic. We don't question their authenticity. We don't question their authorship. The Word of God, we know, is questioned all the time. Now, these are undisputable facts. You can go home today, this afternoon, on Google and type in which historical document has the most manuscripts. Number one answer, the Bible. And in fact, I didn't even include all of the other manuscripts for the Bible because there's copies of the New Testament in Latin, Synoptic, Prussian. I was just looking at the Greek ones. Realistically, there are, all, there are close to, if not over, 30,000 manuscript and manuscript fragments for the Old and New Testaments combined. Undeniable facts. Now, if this is true, and it is, except for me giving all the other people 10,000, why do some people still not believe? Well, there's several reasons. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 that people would love only themselves or their money. So there are some people that they are just interested in them. They don't want to love anything outside of themselves. Jesus said of some in John chapter 8, verse 44 through 47, that some people are of their true father, the devil. Some people love themselves. Some people have no interest in God or religion at all. Some people, according to 1 John in verse 2, love the world. It's not that they don't believe in God. It's not that they love themselves even. They just love all of the baubles and trinkets that the world has to offer. But let's look at something else. This is called textual variance. Okay, a textual variant. It's the difference between the wording of two or more manuscripts. Okay. 
Now, it's well known that the New Testament has been copied with 99.5% accuracy. Now, some people won't believe because it's just 100%. It's not 100% accuracy. But 99.5% accuracy. That means that the vast majority of what we call these textual variants, they are insignificant in that they don't change the meaning at all. And we're going we're gonna to look at one so you know what I'm talking about. Because what about that remaining 0.5%? Well, within the small percentage of variants that are significant in that they affect the meaning uh, of the text. And in some cases, scholars can't be sure which reading is authentic. You know? Uh, some of it is, you know, like maybe me when I was getting in trouble in middle school. And, uh, you know, we had this thing, I don't know what it's called now, but we had Saturday sack is what we called it. And basically you got in trouble. You had to go to school on Saturday and all you did was write five pages uh, reports all day, starting with A in the encyclopedia. Yeah, kids, this was before the internet was a thing. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I was writing reports about aardvarks. <laughs> But occasionally you might change a word or you know, write bigger or something like that. Kind of the same thing happens when people are copying. But I will tell you this. The good news is that none of these variants, they, they don't affect any core Christian doctrine at all. Most only impact one or two verses with a couple of exceptions. Generally, what it is is maybe there's something that's not in this account. Like, let's say it's not in Matthew, but it is in Mark. So it doesn't really change anything. It's just not in this particular text, right? So I want to look at one of them today. The first, uh, there's 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. So we're going to look at that. We've got the verses up here. And it reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So that's how it reads. That is the King James uh, 1611 authorized version as to how it reads. But if you open your own Bible, it doesn't read that way, more than likely, unless you're using King James or perhaps the 1901 American Standard Version. Most modern translations read it this way. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. You can see the faded out portion there. That's where the, the King James is. Now, the reason for the difference, and you, you might be sitting there reading it a couple of times, being like, well, where does it make a difference? I'm, I'm, is, am I missing something? No, you're not missing anything at all, because even though they read, you know, even though a portion isn't there, it reads the same. And the reason is because most of the earlier manuscripts don't contain what we would call the questionable section. But it found its way into the King James translation of the 17th century, which didn't utilize the earliest manuscripts. Now, I'm not bashing the King James translation. I love it. It's very poetic. I grew up on it. It's what my memory work is in. and never love the translation. But they were going based off of the documents that they had at the time. We have since, prior to 1611, discovered more documents that date farther back. Which is why a lot of the modern translations do not have that. In fact, most scholars, even very conservative ones, conclude that this section was not in the original writing. Yet you look at it and it doesn't change anything at all. If you look in your Bible, you might see it there in italics or hard brackets. Some don't have it in there. Some will have it in an italics or, or hard brackets. There might be even a note in that section or a footnote that says some of the earliest manuscripts don't include. And then it does the verses you know, next to it. Theologically, some people might think that it's a problem because these words, they clearly affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. But the case for the Trinity can be made easily without them. So no core doctrine is impacted. <coughs> Another notable variant, which we don't have time to read, is Mark chapter 16, 
verses 9 through 20. Now, this is sometimes referred to as the long ending of Mark. Most authorities don't consider this to be part of Mark's gospel in the original. Now, in that section, it speaks of drinking poison, picking up snakes, which is probably not a good idea, right? But it also mentions the resurrection of Christ. Now, considering that the resurrection of Jesus is affirmed elsewhere in Mark's gospel and the New Testament, this variant doesn't impact any core doctrine. It's just not there in the oldest manuscripts that we have. You can look in your Bible and it might have a footnote there saying it's not there. John chapter 7, verse 53 through John 8, 11, That's another one. So again, some of these variants are entire sections like Mark and John. Others might just be a single verse. In fact, you can, you can do this yourself. If you're using the NIV, the, uh, the ESV, or the CSB, uh, even in your electronic copies, you can, you can look in Acts chapter 8, and you can look down the page, and you'll see that it goes verse 35, verse 36, verse 38. Skips verse 37. Because in the earliest, earliest documents, it's not there. Not once in this minuscule 0.5% of existing variants does any doctrine change. There's no contradiction in any of it. Now, uh, I do want you to see something else. If you could, just go ahead and, and uh, look at this graph. This graph, it represents all of the overt, that means plain, not hidden connections in the Bible. And it's divided here, you see, between the Old Testament on the left and the New Testament on the right. Now, I'm not going to ask you to stand there and, you know, be like one of those jars with the M&Ms and try to guess the, the number uh, that's in there. We'll just tell you that in the Bible, there are 63,000 779 connections. It's connections. Some of them are prophecy. Some of them aren't prophecy. But there are 63,779 connections. It is a book with 40 different authors written over the course of 1,500 years on three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, in three different languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, translated with 99.5% accuracy. It's more accurate than my clicker. <laughs> and it tells one united account of history. One united account of history. All of this. 63,779 connections, 40 authors over 1,500 years across three continents in three languages, translated with 99.5% accuracy, telling one united account of history. Friends, let me tell you something. The only way that is possible is with God. The only way it's possible. 2 Timothy 3, the beginning of verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. Or as Peter writes, knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Notice it says they were carried along. It's not the Holy Spirit's going to tell something, you write it when you feel like it. No, I am going to guide you every step of the way, every word of the way, because this scripture is from God. It is God breathed. God's way is perfect. If people can trust the accuracy, the authenticity, and the authorship of all of these other manuscripts, these secular worldly works, where there are gaps of hundreds and thousands of years 
between the time they were written and the oldest document that we have, if they can trust all of that, they can trust the Bible. Because it towers above them all. And if people can do that, so how does the Bible stack up? It outweighs them. It has more connections than any of them. Written in different languages and across three different continents, 40 different people, and yet there is not a single error. There is not a single contradiction. The problem that people have is they will look at a portion of Scripture, they'll read it, say, that doesn't make sense to me, and then they stop. Or they'll read it and they'll look at the little foot reference or something like that and they'll flip back in their pages, they'll read that and they'll say, wow, that doesn't make sense. These two really don't make sense. This New Testament, Old Testament, oh, it must be a contradiction because they don't spend time. But we could actually, we're not going to today, but we could look at famous atheists. Didn't believe in God, but they wanted to disprove the Bible. And so they decided to sit down and study it with the intent of disproving it. They took the time to read it, they took the time to study it, and then they came away being converted. Because when you actually take the time to read and study your Bible, and you don't get your theology and doctrine from Facebook and Twitter, then you're going to find God. Logically, we can trust what the Bible says. So what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says that you must come to Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You have some people, even people like Billy Graham, who had said, you know what? Muslims, they are children of God. They will be in heaven with us. No, they won't. Sorry, and that's not me saying it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, I am. Some just think of Jesus as a prophet. No, he says, I'm the door. I'm the lamb. I'm the priest. So you have to come to Christ. You have to repent. Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. It's not just repenting and saying, I'm sorry. It's repenting and turning away from that life. You have to confess. Matthew 10 in verse 32. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Oh, it's not just good enough to say you believe. You need to say why. You need to say who. You have to be baptized. Mark 16 and verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now some people, they'll look at that verse and they'll say, well, it says if you don't believe, you'll be condemned. So belief is all that's required. No, he said believe and be baptized. Because if you believe, you're going to believe what Jesus said. He set the example. He set the example when he was baptized by John so that, to fulfill all righteousness. Peter in Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, after talking about Noah and the ark, he says, like unto this, baptism now saves you. It's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. It saves you now. It's not some, purif some Old Testament purification ceremony. That immersion that you've been practicing because you've touched a dead body and now you want to get back at the camp. No, that, that same type of thing. But it's what saves you now. That's what one has to do. The most accurate document in the history of humanity says that's what you have to do. If you can base your life off of the philosophy of people whose writings we don't have any copies of, who lived thousands of years ago, then you can trust the Word of God and its 63,779 connections in three languages on three continents by 40 authors over 1,500 years. And what if you don't? What if you don't do those things? What if you don't? Commit. What if you don't confess? What if you don't repent? What if you're not baptized? 
What happens if you choose to ignore God? The Bible, the flawless word of God says, the son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here's the thing, though. That doesn't have to be your ending. That's also where people who make clickers go. The flawless word of God says that, but there is a common thread of hope in the Bible in the over 63,000 connections and across all those centuries. He says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. It's time for you to come home. Don't you see that you can trust the word of Almighty God? It's not some fairy tale. I don't care how many Charlton Heston movies there are. You can believe it. You, you'll look at all of these other things. And say, yeah, I believe that. Yet, they pale in comparison to the evidence of Scripture. If you're here this morning and you're not a member of the body of Christ and you want to talk about becoming a Christian, I've told you what you need to do, but you want to talk about it some more, we can do that. Study more, set up a study with you, we can do that. Maybe you're ready. Maybe this was all it took. Maybe you were the, one of the ones on the cusp and you were just kind of... But now it's right there staring you in the face. You can be baptized. The water's ready. If you're a member of the body, but you need the prayers of the congregation, we will pray with you and for you under the throne of Almighty God because the prayers of the righteous availeth much. If there is, uh, the, we're going to sing an invitation song, but the doors of heaven are open 24-7, 365. But if you'd like to make something known publicly, then you can do that by coming forward as together we stand and as we sing.